and they still shot them. So that's post-racial, if you will. In Mississippi, there are these two sisters, the Scott sisters. They are incarcerated for something like 15 years for like stealing $9 worth of something. One of the women is had kidney dialysis. They will not let her out. She's been in jail like 10 years. This is really, that's post-racial for you. So we don't need to use these words to cover up the fact that we do not have an American existence as an aggregate group of people. Our existence is different. We have higher foreclosure rates, higher unemployment rates, everything else. And so let's call it real. We, I could not be more delighted. I think everyone around this table echoes our collective delight that the agenda has been so moved that we have an African-American man in the White House. And we celebrate him every day. And given all these crazy people in these United States, we also pray for him very regularly. But at the same time, what we must do is understand that Dr. King's dream was not that we had a black man in the White House. The dream was that we had, he said, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their mind, peace and freedom for their spirits, not one black man in the White House. So let us applaud this brother, but continue to do our work. We must close these social and economic gaps. I want to ask you a follow-up right quick. Um, I want to ask you a quick follow-up because um, I, I, I glance to the right of me and I see that Michael Fontra has a copy of this study in front of him. I know this study well because I've been reading it and those of us who read these studies as well. The Kurt Institute on Race at The Ohio State University. As you know, Dr. Mabel just put out a study recently that takes a real hard look at the stimulus package passed one year ago. So if the answer to black folk is, I'm the president of all of America, and the stimulus is what we're going to put forward to help all of America to lift all these boats, the Kerwin study says that joblessness in black America has not been impacted by the stimulus, that black-owned businesses have not gotten contracts as a result of the stimulus, these shovel-ready projects. This isn't me, this is the Kerwin study. And that the federal response to housing, black folk hit hardest when the housing bubble burst. The Kerwin study says that in housing, we've not been impacted by the stimulus. So if the answer from Washington is, Negroes, check out the stimulus, and Kerwin says the stimulus is not impacting black life in America. How do I read that? Travis, here's the thing with the stimulus. We had a set of systems that decided how money was divided that preceded the stimulus. So you throw money at the, and, and folks just do what they've been doing. And so were African-American owned businesses getting their share before stimulus? No. So the stimulus does, has done nothing to change that. When you look at the unemployment situation, clearly I laid that out earlier, we have not seen the targeting but when stimulus money comes to states, many people think that's the best way to distribute it. I say distribute it to cities, because when you distribute it to states, what states often do is use that money to absorb their deficit. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, we're going to use that for the deficit. But when you get it to cities, you get it to who? Black folks, brown folks, old folks, and young folks, because cities are black or brown or older and younger than the rest of America. Mayors will put money, mayors are riding around looking at the blight. They see the empty houses. They see the child care centers that have had to be closed. The libraries. How can you close libraries in an era of illiteracy? But you see libraries closed. But the mayors are the ones then who say, this is where to put the money. And so it seems to me that there has to be a different approach. It seems to me that legislatively, our Congressional Black Caucus and others have to insist that this money be fairly distributed. With the housing piece, Tavis, here's what went wrong there. We gave bankers money that they put in their pockets. They were supposed to lend that money. They were supposed to lend that money, but they didn't lend it. They kept it. And what we've seen, foreclosure rates in our community, double, triple. The number of black folks who have those subprime loans, half of them qualify for real loans, for good loans. But they're not getting them because, again, of targeting. This is why we can't go post-racial, and this is why it is required that we do the kind of policy analysis that we need to do. I mean, the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, Policy Link, other organizations have to systematically provide the kind of research that says this is not happening and this is what we need to do to make it happen. Let me say one last thing in closing. A. Philip Randolph went to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in World War II. When, they, when our people were not getting jobs in, man, in, in, in manufacturing, our people, our Tuskegee Airmen were being discriminated against, but we also weren't getting jobs. He said, you better hook this up or I'm going to bring this many people to Washington, D.C. to tell you something. FDR said, make me hook it up. 
Now, I don't know if FDR was being arrogant or evil, or if he just meant he needed to have somebody behind him to push him. So FD, uh, A. Philip came back and said, I got 100,000 Negroes getting ready to come visit you. And then he signed the executive order that allowed black folks to work in those segregated manufacturing plants. So what I would say, with all due respect to everyone, again, we want, we need this president to succeed. Because if he does not, imagine how far back our agenda will be pushed. But we have to make this president pay attention to our community, just like A. Philip made FDR do it. Please welcome Chicago's own Dorothy Wright Tilbury. Sister Dorothy, I, I come to you now following uh, Dr. Malvo's uh, brilliant presentation on how we are faring, or not as it were, in this economy, what the stimulus is or is not doing, has or has not done for black life in America. I come to you because, in love, at the center of this table, one of the questions it seems to me we have to earnestly wrestle with is how we do this when so many black folk think that to raise these issues is to hate on the president, to give him a hard time, to be unfair to him. He inherited all this stuff from Bush. He's got a lot on his plate. You hear these arguments. You're a former alderman. You're on the radio here in Chicago every day. You have wrestled with these issues. You knew Barack Obama before he first ran for office. You took him around Chicago, introduced him to people to help him get elected to the, California, uh, to the uh, Illinois State Senate here. But this question is real. How do you have this kind of conversation? How do you raise these issues when people think, too many of our people think, that to raise these issues is hating on the president? You know, Dr. King said we'll take the moral authority. It's been 40 years since they murdered Dr. King. So we are wandering around in the wilderness, and it's time to come out. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Time to come out. Now, I think that we have the responsibility to bring the question to the President of the United States. I don't care what color he is, because that's when you're dealing with the content of the character. It's not the color of the man. It's about what's going on with our people. When we look at black people today, and I come from the South, come out of the Civil Rights Movement, I have never in my life, even in Jim Crow, we're in a new era of Jim Crow and black code. I've never seen black folks so fearful. Mm. Mm. What'd you say? Fearful? Scared. You've never seen black folks so fearful and scared. And scared. Tell it, tell it. Black folks are in pain. And this is the first time since we've been in this country that we've been in pain and didn't know what to do about it. I was scared to do something about it. We marched that night because we wanted to break the fear. I remember a, a white man called me on my radio station one day. He said, Dorothy, if I'd have known all I had to do to keep you quiet was to get a black president, I would have been got one. That's very profound. Barack is president of the United States of America. We have to understand what Barack says he believes. So we can't get angry at him, Dr. Mavo, when he says the rising tide would lift our boat, because that's where he was raised. That's not to put anything on him. The descendants of enslaved Africans in America have a different experience. First of all, we're the only group of people in this country that did not voluntarily come here. We are forced immigrants. We're also the only group of people in this country that the American government made laws against to keep in bondage. 